Ahoy there, goobers. Welcome to Create and Destroy. I'm your host, Dan Donnarumma, and this is episode number 20. Super excited about my guest for you today. My guest for you today is the Shoegaze Band Lacing from Chattanooga, Tennessee. So I was able to sit down with Joe Davenport, who plays guitar and is vocalist for the band, Jerry Reed, who plays drums, Robert Parker, who plays guitar, and Joe McCullough, who plays bass. We talked about a bunch of different stuff. We talked about Lacing's most recent release. They released a split with Lazy Legs. We talked about their debut LP, which came out in 2017. That's called Bummer. We also talked about their first EP, Honey Glow, a little bit as well. And Lacing is actually going into the studio very, very soon to record their follow-up LP. So we talked about that and we talked about them preparing for that LP and what goes into that. But we also talked about a bunch of different shit. We talked about guitar gear, They let me know about some cool bands that I've never heard of before. We even talked about cats. I really enjoyed my conversation with those dudes. Super nice guys. And I really hope I get a chance to see them. I've never seen them play before. And I feel like they would be an awesome band to see live. After we had recorded our conversation, I was really excited about the things that we talked about and just our our conversation in general. And it was a reminder to me that the podcast, everything that I'm doing is freaking awesome, man. I This podcast has given me the opportunity to speak to people that probably would not speak to my goofy ass otherwise. And I think that's really cool that I could have a conversation with four dudes in another state and shoot the shit about their band, Shoegaze, and, and just music in general and, and have a good time doing it. So let's get into it. Here's my conversation with the dudes of Lacing. What's going on, guys? So before we delve into questions that I've got on the band and your music, I figured we'd start with introductions and also share what your role in the band is. Uh, I'm Joe Davenport, and I play guitar and sing in lacing. I'm Jerry. I play drums and do noise stuff sometimes. I'm Joe McCullough. I play bass and bass. That's about it. I'm Robert Parker. I'm a gamer and a veteran, and I play guitar and lacing. Hell yeah. Thanks so much for coming on the show, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So how's the weather by you guys? It's Uh, fine. Yeah, it's it's totally mild. They uh, they told us that we were supposed to have some really bad weather today, but uh, in the South, that is uh, almost like just laughable most of the time. Like we didn't get anything. They told us last night, maybe like an inch of snow or something, and then we didn't even get anything. They shut down schools and everything, and there was literally no need. Nothing was coming. I mean, we got a little bit of snow, but it was mostly the Yetis that were bad today because they were anticipating the snow, so they went ahead and you know made preparations to uh, to menace the town. Dude, so like, oh my God, I can't even fathom that where I live. So up, in, I live in Rochester, New York, which is like an hour and a half from the border. Yeah. And not this past week and the weekend before that, we got like two feet of snow. Yeesh. Yeah. So like if we get six to eight inches, things just keep going as normal. I would say once we start getting towards like foot of snow, that's when people start to kind of like... Like, all right, maybe we should shut shit down. Yeah, I, I lived up on Long Island. I know how that is. Where in Long Island? Nassau County, like southern Nassau County, Freeport. Okay, gotcha, man. Yeah, I lived, I before moving to Rochester, I lived in Stony Brook. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so not too far from you. So I've never, I've never been to Tennessee before. What's the music scene like by you guys? <laughs> well, Ooh, uh, I'm not sure that there is one. I mean, here in Chattanooga, it's us. And uh, in Chattanooga itself, we we played a lot of shows with our friends in a band called Prayer Circle. They're a, like a really noisy post-hardcore band, sort of like Jesus Lizard or Piss Jeans kind of stuff. And uh, there's another band in town that we've played with a couple times called Elk Milk, and they're more of like a garage rock sort of band. And then we have a, a bunch of friends that are in the local noise scene because we all come from that. But outside of that, <laughs> it's kind of hard to say. There's a lot of people that sound like they want to be in Apple commercials. Yeah. That's a big one. Yeah. I guess the region rock thing's not as big as it used to be either, right? Yeah, there's like a really Um, established punk scene here that's actually really cool. Yeah, that's really about it. So more often than not, are you guys playing shows outside of Chattanooga? 50-50, I guess. We actually don't get to play as much as we would like to, mainly just due to like real-life schedules and stuff. But we do a decent amount in town, and 
a decent amount. It's about 50 50, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. But like in my old bands, I remember playing Chattanooga three nights in a row. So there's a big difference nowadays. What What do you think has caused the shift from you being able to play shows three nights in a row to maybe there not being as many bands as there once were? I think, think it's, it's more like a matter of us not wanting to oversaturate ourselves in the town. That's one one part of it, I think. Because stuff is popping. It's just not necessarily what we want to pop off with. Yeah. That too, yeah. <laughs> right, right now, we are in the process of, uh, like, we finished writing and practicing for the next record that we're going to put out. And so we're going to go to the studio I guess the weekend after next, but in the amount of time sort of like leading up to that, we've had probably like 15 or 20 bands contact us about either playing shows in town or out of town on the exact dates that we're doing the recording for this next record. And, and so weird stuff like that tends to happen to us where it's like, if we get contacted by someone, it's they're, they're asking us about a show that we almost can never do because of <laughs> some other weird scheduling conflict. When we're not trying to play shows, that's when our inbox starts blowing up. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm assuming then that there's not very many shoegaze or like shoegaze-esque bands by you guys then, right? In this area, not really. Um, yeah, I'm drawing a blank. There's a, oh man, I am feel like a dick. Oh, Balms, there's Balms. Balms, who yeah. are coming to town soon. Yeah. yeah. But uh, no, what's that band out of Raleigh? Pure Ghost. They're probably like one of the only bands close to us, but we don't know those guys or anything. Well, there's also, there's Ray from Birmingham, but we don't know them either. I'm not sure if they are even still a band. They put out a record like a year, a couple of years ago, and they frequently played around us, but we never saw them and we're kind of only aware of them, I guess, after they stopped playing shows like in cities close to us. And so I feel like an ass because I went to school to be a social studies teacher, so my geography should be up to par. But like some of these cities that you're mentioning, like Birmingham, how far are some of, some of those bigger cities from, from where you live in Chattanooga and in uh, nearby states? Well, Chattanooga is actually pretty cool in the way that there may not be a ton of stuff happening here, but it's not super far from everywhere else. Like Nashville's three hours, Birmingham's like three and a half, Knoxville's like an hour and a half, Atlanta's like two and a half. I'd say Raleigh's probably four. I've never actually been there. Asheville's like three hours away. Athens is only like four hours away. There's a lot of places we can hit when we're finally able to. Mm -hmm. Well, we're ready to hit. So you guys are in like a nice little hub of a city then with all these surrounding cities. Yeah. 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 It's the gateway to the South. That's yeah, dog. <laughs> Technically, yes. Yeah. Nice. And, you know, when I was when I was preparing this, this interview and, and the questions for the interview, I started to think about shoegaze and kind of the genre and what has made me be interested in the genre. And, you know, growing up, I was really into heavy and abrasive music. And a lot of the bands would tend to focus on like themes of melancholy and grim stuff. And I feel like even though shoegaze isn't overtly heavy, it can have its heavy moments. And there's definitely themes of of melancholy. And so, you know, what drew you guys to to shoegaze? Hmm. Well, you kick that one off. <laughs> oh well, this is a this is a difficult difficult question to answer. Um, I don't know that there's anything necessarily that drew me to it above other stuff, just like as as a whole. But starting out, I I think like <clears throat> I remember pretty clearly like the first time I heard Loveless and being obsessed with that, and I'd already grown up like listening to stuff like Sonic Youth and Dinosaur Jr. and The Cure. So I felt like I was by the time I heard Loveless, I was sort of primed for something like that. And then a, uh, my friend Jennifer gave me a copy of uh, the first two Slow Dive albums when I was maybe 20. And uh, then I got into them and just sort of like continued on down that path. Somewhere in the early 2000s, Magnet Magazine published this article that was sort of like a shoegaze retrospective at a time when nothing was really happening. There weren't the mid 2000s bands like A Sobe Sexu or A Place to Bury Strangers hadn't really started happening yet. None of the bands had done reunions from the original era. That was kind of over. And the only thing that was really happening at the time that I remember was I remember mail ordering a bunch of records from like this uh, record label called Claire. They would put out stuff by um, some of them were international bands like Ecstasy of St. Teresa and Mallory. And uh, there was a band from Florida that put out an EP that's awesome called Stella Luna. And that's the only thing they ever so did, but good. it's it's so good. <laughs> and it's like four songs in it. I would gladly put it up against any of the heavy hitters of the genre. And it's 
it could hold its own, no problem. It's it's kind of interesting how like just like you were saying, the the genre was kind of like dormant for a while, yeah. And then all of a sudden, in the mid two thousands, it just kind of like started to slowly bubble up, and then it's now it's become it's such a big genre. I think that's a has a lot to do with the internet and how there basically is nothing now like quote unquote safeguarding any genre. Anyone can become an instant expert or an instant super fan of basically any band and it also you know at the same time it seems like some people want to find the most obscure weird things and bring it up so it's probably like half and half that you know what i mean it's just yeah the internet blew it up just like it does everything else for better or for worse at what point did you guys start playing together like what year was that this was 20 summer of 2015 but we'd uh like jerry and i had known each other since i moved to chattanooga from knoxville since that was in 2008 and uh, we were both in the local noise scene doing stuff. Uh, he was booking a lot of shows and playing shows, and uh, he was booking me to play those shows. He has a project called Rurnt, and uh, I had an old project called Millipede, and um, we were, it's sort of like, um, we knew each other from that stuff, and the stuff I was doing as Millipede was like very shoegazy, harsh noise with no vocals. And at some point in early 2015, I started trying to think, what if I did this, but if I wrote songs? And then we got together and started playing. And we knew Joe McCullough from the noise scene as well. He has a project called Sega Worms. We started, we practiced, I think maybe once where it was like the three of us. And then uh, Rob was in a band called Swoon that was a shoegaze band. They were uh, sort of around at the time and had done an EP and had just broken up. And so we, like he and Jerry knew each other from way back when, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. were able to just kind of swoop in and scoop <laughs> Rob up after Swoon broke up. Yeah, I've yeah. known Jerry since I was a freshman in high school, right? Yep. He was, was like, like he was in classes with my future wife. That's <laughs> how I officially It's like 20 that. years ago, right? Something yep. like that. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And actually when me and Joe Davenport were jamming, on the stuff that became the like the Honey Glow EP, basically, me and Joe McCullo were doing a weird drum and bass thing, highly influenced from like Coalesque or something like that. So I was just like, "Hey, I know this bass player," and then it just came together like Voltron. I was the glue <laughs> sticking on them. And so right out of the gate, the band's goal was to to write and and make shoegaze music. Then, right? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Like, I used to think it was really weird for a band to be like, I want to play X genre. And I always thought that was weird because it's like you're pigeonholing yourself. But then just like listening to other people talk about stuff like that and just thinking on my own, it makes more sense. It's like you can go into a genre and know what you want to do and know the things that work for you and actually make it something whole and real as opposed to being like, well, here's the shoegaze part, but here's this black metal part, but here's this sludge part. And it's like... Yeah, I've got all that stuff in my record collection too, but if I can take the shoegaze and actually do that justice, that's way better than trying to throw a bunch of other stuff in it. Well, like, we can aim for shoegaze, but all of the other influences of things we've done before bleed into it just inadvertently, kind of. It just winds up that way, so we can't make something that sounds different than just straight up shoegaze, one particular thing. But we're not trying to write, like, shoegaze beat down or anything yeah. you know <laughs> yeah no, but we, it's noise rock with a lot of flangers no we, we call it shoegaze no <laughs> we had some some uh funny discussions when the first couple of practices trying to figure out like what we were going to do and like one of the songs on honey glow had this working title that was like uh deftones isn't a bad word <laughs> oh, <laughs> because we were talking about how about we were talking about how at oh, the yeah. time that like we were all like really into uh like you know heavy atmospheric stuff like the Deftones and Hum and uh, you don't really you don't really hear a lot of other bands starting to bring those influences in now which is really funny because I think that there are a lot of modern shoegaze bands who are actually very influenced by the Deftones even openly so like I want to say that maybe I can't remember if it's Days or Angel Aura, one of the, those two newer bands from Texas, like did a Deftones cover. Really? Yeah, like mm -hmm. just flat out covered them. And that's it was, awesome. And it, and it that makes, is and awesome. It makes all, all, you hear it and you're like, it makes all kinds of sense. When you guys were forming, what were some of the bands that were influencing what what you were hoping to make? Well, definitely for us, Slow Dive is always like the holy grail. But we don't, we're not trying to sound like them ever. No, it's it's weird because like we have the bands we like. And I would say they influence us to do things, but it's not like we are like, okay, we're going to do something that sounds like Loveless. Now we're going to do something that sounds like a B-side of Suvlaki. They're not direct influences as far as we want to sound like them, but they are direct influences to bring us into the genre and 
you know, want to do it. Because like he said, Slow Dive is... I've even told members of Slow Dive that they're better than my bloody Valentine. It's mm-hmm. it's the fucking truth. It's so good. And we could I could spend the rest of this podcast talking about that. Yeah. But I'm not gonna. But yeah, I hope that kinda answered that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and and so you guys recently released a split with Lazy Legs. Yes. And this split is so freaking awesome. Thank you. I, I really enjoy all the songs. You're welcome. I really enjoy all the songs on on the split. First, how did you guys wind up working with Lazy Legs for the split? Oh, this is easy. Um, so <laughs> one of, I can't remember if it was Rob. Or it was they, Rob. It was Rob. Yeah. Uh, discovered Lazy Legs. Was it through Bandcamp? Uh, I think I saw them on the shoegaze subreddit or something like that. <laughs> yeah, and so he was like, you guys should check this out. And so, you know, we're always looking for other, for new shoegaze bands to listen to. And this was right around the time we were starting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, so we were really into the first, like, Lazy Legs EP. Like, way, way into it. It was like the first thing we kind of bonded over. So this is before we even did Bummer, and we were talking about, like, we should, do a, we should just kind of reach out to this band. They're just starting, we're just starting. Let's see if they want to do a split with us. And they, we couldn't believe it when they said yes. <laughs> And so then we spent the next like two years trying to make it happen on both the buyer ends. Yeah, it was it was a long ordeal because then around the time we agreed to do it, that's when it's like, oh, we got to record our record. And then we were finally going to do the split and then we had somebody lined up to put it out and then they had a bunch of stuff happen and they couldn't. And that's totally fine. We were still like, it was done, done. So it's like, well, I guess we're just going to put it out ourselves. I'm just glad it's out. Mm-hmm. I freaking love the song Crush. And I love that that's the opening song of the split. Could you talk about that song, what it's about, and maybe what spurred you writing that song? Oh, my goodness. Well, um, the original. OK, so can I I just want to say something because this is really funny. Crush is the song that, and we've never really discussed this internally, so you may get some interesting comments here. I think Crush is the song that like almost ended us as a band. Um, we, when we initially started working on it, we had a Rob brought in the riff for Crush, and it was in this like really odd time signature, and we tried to play it really, really slow, like a like almost like a slow dive song or a Cure song. I don't. <laughs> and uh, we like we had this really we had this like a bunch of very heated arguments about the time signature of that song and we put it on the back burner like we had this we were working on crush before bummer came out and it was a song that we sort of maybe even had as a contender for that record if, if we had finished it but we like I don't know it I, I felt like it was causing us to fight with each other so so we stopped working on Crush for like, I guess almost a year. <laughs> and then we brought it back and uh, I, I showed them like, I, I took Rob's original riff and like sort of chopped it a little bit to make it fit a time signature that was easier to work with. And uh, then we just sort of uh, jammed on it until we made it into this pop song, which first initial couple of run throughs of it, we sort of had these feelings where we were like, is this too pop of a song for us? <laughs> And then we just sort of went with it anyway. Oh, I'm so glad you guys decided to keep working at that song. That song is so goddamn good, man. Thanks a bunch. Is that normal for you guys The that you work on a song and maybe it takes that long to write? Or is it for you, for some of your other stuff, does it not take that long? Oh, I, yeah. Well, like, no, I think I, mean, I brought in Regret around the same time as I brought in Crush, right? Yeah. there's oh, uh, yeah. It's, it's very <clears throat> weird because songs for us tend to go one of two ways. Either like somebody will like, if I have a song, sometimes I'll bring something in and I'll have a song that's like nine. 90% done, right? Where it's got lyrics and like a song structure and like we'll end up playing it like really close to the version that I bring in. And then other times I'll bring in something or like Joe or Rob or some will bring in something or like Jerry will have an idea for something yeah, and we'll start write, to though. we'll start mm-hmm. to work on it and it'll end up like it'll take us like 6 months or more to sort of like figure our way around whatever this piece of music is and the whole time we're like having these you know pretty intense discussions about what it should sound like and that lyrics are are one of those things where like i feel like lyrics are really important but they're also not important if that makes sense like they're always the last thing that's written unless i'm writing them like at the exact same time that i'm writing like a song that i bring in which is about 50 50 like the rest of the time i feel like especially if i'm listening to some other band i don't notice I don't, sometimes I don't notice the lyrics unless they're incredibly bad. Like if they're really good, then I sometimes notice. But the my goal is always to write something that I feel or like take something that we feel through ideas that we introduce to each other and then do it justice. And uh, as long as I, you know, regardless of whatever it ends up being like, eventually it's, 
the goal is the, to try to get on a page where we're not putting out anything where somebody in this band is like, I don't like that, which mm-hmm. is difficult because there's four of us. And sometimes there's always one person <laughs> yeah. that's like, I don't like that. And we, we, we don't ignore each other. That That's very interesting that you mentioned that. That's that's kind of a common theme that I've been hearing from people that I've interviewed that the lyrics, I, I don't want to say are like a... Uh, put on the back burner in terms of the songwriting process, but usually the lyrics and the vocal patterns wind up being one of the last things that those artists are working on. Do you guys talk about themes that you want to address in songs or is that all uh, essentially boil down to you, Joe? Um, I would say that we talk uh, somewhat about the themes a lot of the lyrical content is like stuff that I write and then I'll show them and then say like, what do you think about this? And if they give me the thumbs up, then we go for it. Uh, and usually if I'm writing lyrics, it's about something that it's it, lyrics are weird, right? Because I don't want to write something that's so specific that somebody else can't relate to it. Like I'm not thinking about an audience when I'm writing the lyrics, but I also am not the kind of lyric. I want people to be able to like project themselves on into whatever they hear, as opposed to writing something that's so specific that, you know, it's like, that's not relatable to a person that hears it. If I feel strongly enough about something that's happened to me or something that, you know, inspires me to write some lyrics. I don't know. I want that to come across in a way that's somewhat clear, but also vague enough that a person can hear it and go, it makes them feel something. I don't know if that's a, that, I, I, that sounds very strange, I'm sure. No, no, that, that totally makes sense. I know for me, you know, cause I, I try to write stuff and when I'm writing lyric, something that I think could potentially be, li- be lyrics, that does cross my mind. I'm not writing like EPs or albums or anything, but that is definitely a thought that I have is, is this something that's relatable? Does it sound too cliche or too corny? So those are definitely thoughts that I have as well. Prior to the recent split that you guys put out, you guys released your debut LP, Bummer, which is a great album. Yeah. And and that you're very welcome. And that came out about a year and a half ago now. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just know we record when it's really cold down here. That's all I know. Yeah. So wait, what's really cold for you guys? Oh, really cold for us is like anything. 60. 60 <laughs> Come on, this is in North Florida. Yeah. Uh, I'd say like. 30. Between 20 and freezing 30. and oh. 20. So, so not, I thought it'd be much warmer than that. So not that much, that, not that bad. Actual um, winter weather. Gotcha. All right. And so now that some time has passed since that album was released, what comes to mind for, for each of you when you think back to those songs, the, the time that you spent writing those songs and maybe, you know, just the process of putting that album, album together. Well, I know hmm. some of those songs were written directly after the first, uh, tape we did, which I've seen listed as a demo, but it's not a demo. It's just a <laughs> non-mastered EP. Get it right. Come on. Uh. But so a lot of those songs were almost written around the same time as the Honey Glow stuff. Well, like we had summer cool. since like the third or fourth show, and it it sounded really close mm-hmm. to what ended up on the record, even though we recorded it like a year and a half after we wrote it. It's uh yeah, and then mm-hmm. and then the other stuff like Milk, we were working on right up to the point where we went to the studio and <laughs> we didn't we, finish it till we, after we recorded it. <laughs> yeah, we recorded it, and we uh, like when we started playing it later on, we started chopping the end of it some because we were like, well, that riff goes on for an eternity, <laughs> and maybe it shouldn't have, but we didn't. We didn't take the time to finish it because we were we were like, well, we got to we booked the studio time and we're out of time and we've got to go. <laughs> yeah, I was a, a huge Sparkle Horse fan when I was in high oh, school, yeah, yeah. and it didn't dawn on me that we were about to record with half of Sparkle House, Sparkle Horse, <laughs> until the drive up there. So the whole time I was like, kind of geeking out, trying to like keep it in. Yeah, I didn't want to like bug him with questions and stuff, you know. Yeah, that was recorded by Scott Miner. Who played drums, right? Yeah, he, well, he did a lot of stuff too, right? Oh, okay. he's a multi. I, he's a he, he was half of Sparkle Horse, basically. He was the horse. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Were you nervous or like recording your parts of oh, for sure, uh, yeah. the songs? I gave him no pushback on any of his suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair, all his suggestions were really good. So yeah. there yeah. I mean, he knows what he's doing. It. The only thing I would take back about that record is I wish we recorded track by track instead of live. Yeah. But um, yeah. besides that, the experience was great. We got to stay with uh, a good friend of Joe Davenport's up there. Shout out to Nathan. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just a good time. That's awesome. Could you could you maybe elaborate on why you wish you recorded the album track by track instead of live? I got, oh, so- I got that one. <laughs> you got that one? Yeah, go, please. Well, uh, we did the Honey Glow EP tape, non-demo. That, uh, we did that here, track 
track by track. Here being his house. Yeah, we're in my house right now. We were able to play each thing at the volume that we play live, basically, and I mic'd everything. Right. We're like lower than live, but good enough to sound like us. But when we went into the studio up there for Bummer, we said, this would be great, you know, we could record it live, but then we didn't realize that we're in the same room and there's a lot of like leakage in the mics if we were that loud so we i think he was turn. unprepared for our actual volume yeah. we had <laughs> to turn way way down yeah, yeah. because the yeah. studio we did it at it's a great studio mm -hmm. yeah uh wild chorus is awesome and yeah. i recommend anybody in our neck of the woods to go and if you want to make the drug go but they're more doing like punk and jazz and mm -hmm. like garage rock that's i mean that's the stuff i heard him put out so yeah. I mean, I don't know if you can tell from the stuff we recorded, but we're pretty, we're pretty, pretty loud. Bit, yeah, we're a pretty <laughs> obnoxiously loud band. Mm -hmm. Like, we, we, I don't know, we like to push some air. So mm -hmm. I feel that Bummer doesn't necessarily reflect us as a live band, but at the same time, it's kind of cool. Regardless. Yeah, it's, it's cool as its own singular thing. You yeah. Know? Yeah, to me, when I if I were to compare Bummer to the, the recent split, like Bummer almost sounds more fuzzy. Than than the the recent split the song the songs in the recent split almost sound I don't want to say cleaners that's not the right word I guess just like less fuzzy and I and I don't know if that's from the the ways that you guys recorded the two different the two separate releases or not but when I listen to them I could definitely tell that there is somewhat of a difference in the songs and how they sound yeah yeah, yeah for sure. I would personally love to not be in this band and to hear Bummer to see what it sounds like to, <laughs> so because to me. I'm like, yes, the parts are great, et cetera, et cetera, but it's, I don't feel that it super reflects us. And, I mean, that's not anyone's fault. Yeah. It's just shit happens. I mean, that's life. Making feedback is, like, a huge part of what I <laughs> oh, do, yeah. you know? And yeah, I just didn't really have the opportunity, you know, at the volumes that we were recording. So we, we we pretty much spent a whole day just me overdubbing feedback, right? Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, love, I love that, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, did a, we did a lot of that. But, but certain, certain songs that are on Bummer sound exactly like like summer in particular sounds exactly like how i thought that it would sound but then other songs where the version that's on bummer of something like say starless sounds like like it i'm sure it sounds really heavy but i feel like if you hear us play starless live it's like it is a very very different experience you'd mentioned this earlier um, cause you guys are going into the studio to record a new album. I've, I've never recorded any music before. So w when you go and record, how much is the person that it, you're working with and recording the, that music, how much are they giving you feedback? How often are you listening to what they're saying? Do, is it like a give and a take? Well, I guess it's uh, it's less of a, a role of that engineer being, I guess, like a producer messing with the actual song itself and more of them telling us the best ways they know of to get sounds out of the equipment that we own or that we're borrowing from them to use. And we, we like to heed to what they say so it's most beneficial. They they real like when we recorded Bummer with uh, with Scott Miner and, and Carrie Balch, they, um, Carrie. the kinds of feedback that they gave us weren't related to like how we structured the songs or anything like that. The things that they did were um, one. The thing that they did that we loved the most was they did this thing where they panned the vocals like hard right and left, and then sort of doubled everything so it sounds. I don't know. It it has this like otherworldly quality to it that none of the other recordings that we have do vocal wise. But then um, at one point we had discussed like having Bummer be a very very dry record where there was almost no reverb on it. We sort of went back and forth on that a whole bunch of times and then it ended up adding some reverb to it but not like you know a ridiculous amount but they never came in and said like you guys should think about cutting this part of this song or yeah. like you should think about singing a different way it was nothing like that i don't think i would actually be happy with dealing with someone like that because no. i mean we could write the shittiest vocal line or you know part ever but that's our shitty part and if it's gonna <laughs> suck and people are gonna hate it that's on us that's we're not yeah. paying you to polish us or whatever. I I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I want to own our fuck ups. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I totally understand that. So, are you guys going back to the same studio that you recorded Bummer? No, no. We're going to be recording this next record with uh, Mikey Allred at a place called Dark Art in Nashville. And um, I think the record that most people would know him from was he recorded Inner Arma's Paradise Gallows. Is that the newest one? Yeah. He did the last two. 
Yeah, he did the he did whatever recent thing that they recorded that's not out yet as well. So and was that one of the reasons why you guys decided to to go to that studio? Well, we knew I knew Mike. I've known Mikey for uh, a long time. Same. And um, it was one of those things where we uh, one of our early shows we played with. Uh, he's in a band called Holy Mountain Top Removers, and we played a show with them. And um, he mentioned he sort of like offhandedly mentioned at the time that he had a studio. And then we heard that Inner Arma record, and uh, like I'm not a huge Inner Arma fan, but that record sounds awesome. So we were hoping that you know he could bring some of that to us, to what we've got. Like we figured if he could handle a rec- recording something as heavy as Inner Arma, that he could definitely handle like you know a shoegaze band like us, where we like <clears throat> sometimes dip over borderline into sludge. When I first saw the bill for that band, I was like, oh my god, we're playing with the Holy Mountain and a band called Top Removers. That's so tacky. <laughs> <laughs> so when you guys are preparing to go into the studio like what what's going through your head as you're getting ready for that experience don't fuck up yeah definitely yeah. don't absolute fuck up. panic yeah there's a lot of panic on this end for sure i mean we spent all day sunday and saturday day saturday like just just going through these songs just over and over and over again until we were ready to uh to die basically (laughs) it's a lot of cleaning up of stuff that's not necessary in each song so that it comes through uh, the most concise i guess we want to be one take johnny's you know what i mean (laughs) do you guys have a set amount of time or days that you're going to be there or is it we're going to see what happens we're going to be there for basically a month off and on for I think, not a month as in 30 days. No, 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 no. It's like the, 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 we're going to be there for, I think six days total over the course of a month. Yeah. It's like basically every other weekend. Yeah. From six weeks. Yeah. From mid, from mid February to mid March, we'll be in Nashville working on that. And how does that compare to how long it took you to record bummer? I'm assuming the um, honey glow EP and the split probably didn't take as long, but maybe I'm wrong in that assu- assumption. I think we yeah, did the split in what? One weekend. Yeah. My Minus yeah. the vocals, anyways. Mm-hmm. We we did the split. We did one day of recording drums and bass and some guitars, and then the second day to record overdubs and stuff like that. Some, yeah, you know, that sounds about right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We did all of Bummer in four days. <laughs> it was insane. We went in. We would get up and like go into the studio at like I don't know eight or like. No. Was, no, 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 like was noon. It, was it, was it, was it's it like eleven. 11. Yeah. We'd yeah. get up around eight. Oh, we, but yeah. then we would work until like really late at night, and then get up and do it again. So, and we were just. It was one of those things where because instead of recording them track by track brick by brick we were recording all of bummer like together at once so if one person fucked up a take we have to do it over again so like what you mean when Jerry fucked up the tape, <laughs> I did not mean we that. had to do it all over again. Uh, <laughs> That's how I felt. Anyway. But we just, you know, so we were, we spent like a bunch of time just basically grinding through those songs. And like, you know, we got to the point where mm. after Bummer, after we did Bummer and after like the last year of playing those songs like live, where we just, I don't want to sound resentful, but we almost like, you get to a point where you're like, do I have to do this one more time? Yeah. Because th- some of those songs, like the... the They're all fucking long. They're, they're, they're some of the songs long. are really long. <laughs> Starless is really long. It's like, Starless is like eight minutes, which is long <laughs> yeah. for... It's, that's long for us. Uh-huh. And, and uh, yeah, and Drain is almost that long too. <laughs> and, the, and the thing about those songs too is that the lyrical... Uh, this is probably true for most of our songs, but like the lyrical, the subject matter of them is like pretty depressing and like... Sometimes it's easy for me to sing lyrics that they mean something to me and like to, to forget way. about that. And then there are other times where like if if we play a song like Wound where oh, I, I feel like the, the things that I felt when I wrote that song sort of come back almost every single time and it's it can be kind of difficult. That That's interesting that you say that. So I'm thinking the shit, what, I, I think the song is called Honey Glow, right? On the, on the Honey Glow EP, that song's what, like 10 minutes long or some shit like that? Yeah, the, the instrumental piece, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, that song's great though, man. Nice. Cool, thanks. When when you're going into, into the studio, do you know that the record that you're going to be recording or the release that you're going to be recording is going to have this exact number of songs or it's we're going to record maybe let's say 13 14 songs and maybe two or three of them won't get added to that release well with bummer we knew the amount of songs mm-hmm. this time we're going to go in with a certain amount and most likely maybe all of them will be there but we have some segues so we have to see exactly how long each one well, it's like we've really been keeping track of trying to find the optimal time limit per side of an LP and stuff like that. So it's like we have X amount of songs ready to go and we plan on recording them all, but we already know 
which ones are probably going to be excluded from the record because there's a possible split seven inch coming out sometime. Oh shit. And uh, maybe something else. So we'll have, you know, we'll have a few in our back pocket to drop when, when needed. Nice. And so, cause you, you were talking about the length of the songs. Will these new songs, are they going to be somewhat shorter than some of the other songs you have previously released? Some of them are. Some yeah, of, them, a lot of them, some, some of them are. There's one called Violet that's like seven minutes. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Uh, it's also but, my favorite. So. But uh, but yeah, some of the other ones are are like shorter than Bummer for sure. So it's what? Like, Bummer had what seven tracks? Only yeah, yeah but six songs. There's the six drone songs, piece seven tracks. There. But I think the new one will have what like nine. It will have at least ten? eight. The the new one we've got ten songs written, and we're looking at like probably having to cut at least one of them from the record, and then yeah. with seg we'll have some segues as well. Sometimes it's pretty shocking to learn how long our songs are, you know. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so we're playing and they just kind of blaze by. Yeah. yeah. So is it easier for you guys to write shorter songs or longer songs? Because I feel like for me, when I write stuff, if I'm trying to write something that's shorter, it's almost more of a challenge than if it's, uh, who gives a shit how long this is? Oh, well. Definitely shorter, I'd say. <laughs> well, I feel that it just, whatever works for the song. It's like, yeah. if we have a really fast one, you know, you don't want to play fast for like nine minutes, mm -hmm. or at least I don't, because I play drums and I'm lazy. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's like, yeah, this one works. And it's like, the other one would be like, well, I think we could repeat this. We could do the A part four more times mm -hmm. and it will sound awesome. And it winds up being seven and a half minutes, but it's good. So I think it really just, you know, comes from what the song <clears throat> calls for yeah i don't think we've ever had been in a situation where it was like okay we need to pad this fucker out <laughs> no <laughs> that's like, never happened no. if anything we've tried to rein some stuff in like we had yeah. a we had this one two discussions we had going into recording this going into working on material for this record were a the songs on bummer were like pretty long so maybe we ought to try to write some shorter songs because there's an average length for them they're all between six and a half and seven and a half minutes damn long. yeah but then, um, except for maybe the your thing. Mm -hmm. But then we also had this thing where we, as a band, felt like on autopilot, a thing that we tend to do is we would write a song and then we get to the end of it and then we would be like, well, let's just keep playing this end part for a long time. <laughs> you know, hence when we were talking about how like milk at the end of Bummer goes on for too long. Yeah. We didn't know what to do, so we just kept playing that ending for like eight, eight measures, and it should have been like half of that. Which is, yeah. if you ever hear it live, that's what it sounds like now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's been post recorded edited. <laughs> yeah. I think it's been retired at this point. <laughs> yeah, we stopped playing that song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then eventually we're just like, fuck it. Do you guys know, will you know ahead of time what the order of the songs will be on the album? Or is that something that you'll work on later? We'll agonize over that, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've already started that process. We, uh, we've we already started talking about what what songs are going to go where. We have a pretty good, we've got a pretty good idea of where the tent poles are. <laughs> yeah, it's like we record our practices so once those are broken down in actual you know tracks we can even though they won't sound like the studio obviously we can kind of play around with a track listing and be like well maybe this would work before this and da 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 mm -hmm. and so we're actually going to I want to do that tonight with the recordings we have yeah, if, if you're listening to this and you're in a band I highly recommend you record every single one of your practices would you yeah. like to do a product plug Oh yeah, I I prefer the Zoom H5. <laughs> oh man, I got I got a Zoom H6. This thing is awesome. I was using a Tascam before then, and I had to get rid of it because the Zoom is so much better. Totally, oh, wow. yeah. Uh, I'm Tascam jealous. Tascam just sounds cooler than Zoom. Tascam. It does, but yeah, it was it was not as good. Nowhere near as good. Where do you guys see shoegaze and like shoegaze adjacent? genres of music like dream pop and post-punk going in the next several years because like we were talking about earlier these genres were kind of dormant for a little bit and not super popular and they definitely have i don't want to say blown up but they've been they're much more active much more popular over the last several years well i think it'll be just like almost any other genre in the post internet age where it'll reach a peak and then it'll drop off but it'll still exist and a lot of bands will quit because Maybe they're just into it because it's hot for the minute or whatever. No, I mean, like, did you else. know Witch House is making a comeback? Really? <laughs> How weird is that? That was, like, really popping yeah. for, like, eight months. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and then it just kind of went away. But, the you know, the people that are down are going to stay down. When is Sea Punk gonna come back? I really, I really enjoyed Sea Punk. <laughs> you just want to dye your hair aqua. I mean, while I've got it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Collectively, how many pedals do you think you guys have? Oh, good. Oh, God. God. I, was, <laughs> I was counting boards last practice. 
Base is eight. You're like at I'm nine at, or ten. I think I'm, I'm, a, I'm a ten. I'm about to add an eleven. And I think you're at seven. I'm at no. I'm at like I'm easy at like seven eight. Or eight. eight mm-hmm. I'm at eight or nine for sure. But then if you include everything I have, good lord, <laughs> in the noise shit, then we're looking at more like total. Well, that's close not to fifty. You're not mm-hmm. including the pedals that we don't have on our boards. Oh, like yeah. I've got three. Oh yeah, like, oh, yeah. yeah. I've got about <laughs> five or six. Just and those will all be making it to the studio. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's it's a lot. God damn, dude. I got I to gotta grow my pedal collection. I was talking to a dude in a band in Rochester. He was telling me he's got like 40 pedals. Just like, how the fuck have you accumulated that many pedals over there? It must have been so much goddamn money. So, well, no, so, the cool thing is now a lot of companies are making pedals that they're basically clones of things that still sound really good. And they're like half the price. And super and cheap. Mm-hmm. They're super cheap. And they're physically smaller than most. So you like, okay, so like the Ditto Looper is around $100. But there are other loopers that are half the size and half the price that work just as well. So mm-hmm. the Wally. Moor. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Moor. Moor like, is a great brand. Or like I have a bunch of fuzz pedals and um, yeah. like Too all, many. almost, yeah, <laughs> I've got like five or six fuzz pedals and all of them are super cheap. Not as in like they would be that cheap to, if you went to buy them new. But if you go on eBay and Craigslist and you look for something where somebody's like, this thing's beat to shit, but like it still works. My favorite Big Muff fuzz pedal is like a pedal that I bought for I think $15 from a person on reverb.com where they were like it does it it works and I was like that's all you needed to say it works <laughs> well dude you know? I just got that one uh that was, was this called the New York Big Muff is that what they consider it yeah. the big silver yeah, face the, the NYC silver one the yeah. NYC I got it for $30 because there was a screw up on it and then I found a spare part on another non-working pedal and fixed it and besides some scratches in the paint it's fine and that's like a what 80 to 100 dollar pedal mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you look for deals like that or like, in an, I mean, I also got to a point where I was like, well, I've got other stuff that I could sell and buy some pedals, you know, so I sold off some of my record collection and bought some pedals if I, or like, you know, sold some clothes, things like that or whatever. But straight up, you do not have to spend a lot of money for good tone. Nowadays. Yeah. No. Check out a cheaper pedals.com. You'd be amazed at how much stuff costs on there. It's funny, I got, so I have a um, Electroharmonix uh, reverb pedal, and then the for graph. Christmas, I got, so it's like, it's a, it's called a Canyon, yes. so it's got like reverb and a bunch of other different things that you could do, and it's actually fucking awesome. That pedal was like 130 bucks, and then I recently bought a Behringer reverb pedal for like 30 bucks. I actually enjoy the reverb on that Behringer pedal more than the, the Canyon pedal I got. If you're looking for a fuzz, the Behringer fuzz is like $25, and it sounds Mm-hmm. It's awesome. It's an yeah, it's an orange pu- fuzz pedal called their Super Fuzz and it is a clone of the Boss FZ2 which is an insanely uh rare pedal now and it sounds That's a clone of the Super Fuzz. Yeah, it's it? a clone of the mm-hmm. Super fu- of the original yeah. Super Fuzz. And the original Super Fuzz is like a $400 pedal now. So it's those things are stupid. But the thing about the Behringer one is it comes in a cheap plastic enclosure. But the thing is is the pedal sounds awesome. So if you're looking for a fuzz pedal that sounds awesome and you're you're like poor, you can go and buy that Be- <laughs> Behringer cheap. Fuzz for like, you know, 25 bucks brand new. And it has three different settings on it. It's got like what? Fuzz 1, Fuzz 2 and Boost yeah, or something it, like that. Yeah, it sounds awesome. It, I cannot stress enough to you that like Fuck people who say that like you have to go out and buy these like four hundred dollars Strymon pedals and like yep. you know Strymon. obsess over your tone and stuff. Like, I mean, to a certain extent, I think everybody that plays music sort of obsesses about what they sound like. But like, you can there's a there's a way you can do things that's affordable that won't destroy you financially. And like, I'm all about trying to you know be responsible with that kind of thing. Boom. Unless you're like a grown up lawyer that happens to play the blues, <laughs> fuzz face. <laughs> 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 Yeah, there's no reason you need to spend a lot of money on pedals, just straight up. I have another product placement I like to make. Um, if, pick up the Zoom Multi Stomp series, oh, yeah. oh, the yeah. MS70 CDR. These things are amazing. They're like $120, and I never thought I would say this about a Zoom pedal, but it's like it like changed the game for me. You know, it has like <laughs> well, shit, I want to say two of them now. Yeah, I have two yeah. of them on my board. Um, I think there's like something between 50, 75, something different uh, effects built into it, and you can build. Uh, pedal chains in the pedal itself and then save up to 50 presets so i have a handful of presets that i've you know made for each individual song plus Um, it has stuff like compressor and yeah so i've got one that's like all of my like 
crazy reverbs and choruses and stuff like that. And I have another one that's just like pure utility. It has like uh, my my noise canceling, my my noise gate, my compression, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that, that's a trick I learned from uh, Michael from Lazy Legs. Um, but check them out. The, the MS-70 CDR. I can't recommend it enough. Nice. I feel like after this freaking episode, I have like three companies that could wind up freaking <laughs> sponsoring this episode with all the shit that we're talking about with companies. So I also like I follow you guys on Instagram and I see that you guys are always posting about or, or posting about your your Fender stuff. So like are you guys do you guys ex- exclusively rock Fender? Pretty much exclusively I would mm-hmm. say. Um, yeah. Like I mean I, I've owned other guitars before and uh, they were they were all right but like it's weird. I bought the first Jazzmaster that I had back in like 2005 and I still have it and it's still the, my, the best guitar that I've ever played and I, I didn't pay very much money for it and it sounds better than almost any other guitar that I've ever owned and it's like I don't know it feels right and so the like I don't know I love jazz masters and jaguars it's kind of like with camera gear i'm like super into canon just because i saw a canon years ago when i was younger and i thought it looked it was the coolest freaking thing when i was younger i don't remember who it was i saw play a les paul but i was like that guitar is fucking incredible and ever since then i've been into gibson and like i have an epiphone sg that i play um so i feel like it's got to be similar right you kind of just like stick to what you wind up falling in love with right yeah Mm -hmm. yeah for sure also to be fair the Fender shit's got the, was it the vibrato bridge or whatever? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that comes in super handy with, yeah. when you're gazing at your shoes and whatnot. <laughs> I will say when I was, uh, I was recently, before I got the SG, I was looking at getting a Jazz Master. I'd never played one of those before. Some of the settings on that guitar are fucking awesome. Like you can make some super cool tones with that guitar without any distortion pedals or anything like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. The Jazz Master can sound like three or four different guitars. That's the thing that I like about it the very most. Don't you have two of them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. <laughs> We're definitely offset boys in this band. <laughs> and so like one of the last things I wanted to talk to you guys about was cats and how yeah! freaking awesome, <laughs> how freaking awesome cats are. So do all you guys have cats? Hey, yep. Oh yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah for it's sure. It's the superior pet. <laughs> no shit. Do do any of you have dogs? No. We're getting one this year cuz my one of my daughters really wants one, but I would rather get another cat. But I'm not going to tell her that. <laughs> we had a, um, like, a, okay, so this is a sad, true story. Right before we recorded Bummer, we had a, a we went through a thing where it was like. Oh, yeah. We were every, all losing cats. Every single one of us, like, all of our cats died within, like, two to three months of each other. Well, like three of you. Yeah, yeah, not okay. not Joe not Joe McCullo, but, like, yeah. uh, my wife and I and our daughter, we had a cat that we'd had for a really long time. She was, like, 15 years old, and she had a bunch of health problems. And she died. My cat was 14, and she passed. Mm-hmm. Mine was, uh, well, I guess I lost two cats, kind of. Like, I lost yeah. one during Bummer and then one right after. But the cat I lost during Bummer was really special. I, uh, it's a booger. Uh, no, it's a Ziggy. Oh. Ziggy. It's a cat. Yeah, I used to work that. at the public library in Catoosa County, and someone, like, shoved this pregnant cat into the book drop one day. What? Yeah. <laughs> Dude, what the fuck? And I took her home, and, you know, she was with me for 12 years, I guess, afterwards. It was a crushing loss. Man, you know, this may sound weird to some people, but I had a cat who was 15 when he died. This fucking guy had FIV. He had like kidney disease. He'd gotten attacked by, I have no clue what, and had like a gigantic gash in his back that he had to get surgery on. Like this dude just lived through so much. And when he died, man, that hit me harder than like some of my family members dying. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel that. I, I grew up with cats. And my wife grew up with dogs. So when we, when my cat that I was just talking about died, she had said that she wanted to get a dog because she'd been kind of saying that for some time. And I kind of was on the fence. And then I was introduced to greyhounds and they are basically just giant cats. Oh yeah, they're totally like, couch potatoes, right? Yeah, dude. So my dog is basically, like I, whenever anyone asks me about my dog, I say she is just a cat in, in a dog's body. <laughs> so yeah, if, you're, if your children want a, a dog, I would highly recommend a Greyhound. All right. Okay. Yeah. Shit, man. Sweet. So you guys are going to be recording. Do you have an idea uh, as far as when that album might be released? Well, Mm. we're aiming for uh, either fall of late fall of this year or early spring of or or, or winter 2020, spring 2020. If that it, it depends on who ends up putting the record out like Elder Magic put Bummer out 
and they Much love, love the them. Magic. Yeah, so <laughs> we want to give a shout out to James and Michael from Elder Magic because oh, they yeah. uh, they the I boss. can't stress enough how supportive they've been of us through everything. And, and besides uh, that, they're just fucking awesome people. Yeah, uh-huh. they're they're incredible, and they pretty much let us do whatever we want to, and I've never da- like. I, I had a conversation with Michael recently where I told him like, hey, we were thinking about like sending copies, demos for the new record off to some other labels just to see what might happen. And he was like, man, you guys do whatever you want. He was like, if somebody else wants to put it out and they're a huge label, let them do it. He was like, if they won't and you want us to do it, he, we will always do it. And yeah, like, I- That's all you I, can ask for, I, man. I, mm-hmm. it, it broke my heart that he said that. <laughs> like that, it made me feel- <laughs> incredible that's awesome man i always like to ask this question what do you guys been listening to lately Hmm. for me it's mainly been these two playlists i made on spotify one's called all them raps and it's three close to three (laughs) days worth of rap music Mm -hmm. and one is called uh only death is real (laughs) which is all death metal and it's about a day long and last podcast on the left and that's been my listening habits for like the past week and or two nice uh i'm in a weird zone where i'm a little behind the times but have one foot in the modern because i just got a spotify account so i've been listening to either mid 90s ambient music in the morning and then like jazz stuff in the afternoon like fast-paced jazz shit in the afternoon <laughs> or chip tune my good buddy i was just hanging out with him uh, this past weekend and my my other buddy and i constantly rag on him because he doesn't have a spotify account and he would listen to music through youtube and he finally just got a spotify account so you got you're in you're in good company with him man <laughs> i was still downloading stuff from blogs up until a month ago till yeah. robert oh i still do out. yeah i still yeah, do I, that. I resisted the spotify thing for so long but as soon as i hopped on i was like how did i ever <laughs> dude same with me man i used to download stuff forever like i would buy the lps or the the seven inches and i would I to download them. As soon as Spotify came out, man, that was like a goddamn game changer. Yeah, nope. yeah. yeah. No more soul seek. No more like Googling <laughs> weird blog spots, trying to yeah. find stuff. No more Googling bands in RAR or yeah, like, yeah, trying yeah. to remember <laughs> like what were some of the other ways I would find shit. Yeah. You guys are describing my life to this moment. <laughs> I mean, that was a decade. I still do all life. that stuff. I, I, I can't. I don't. Uh, I don't know. I I, uh, I like Spotify well enough, but I uh, I still do all of those. We well, don't have a real account. I don't have a real account, mm-hmm. a real Spotify account either. <laughs> so you still have commercials and mm-hmm. yeah. shuffles. And yeah, shit. so it's uh so it's kind <clears throat> of annoying, but uh, but yeah, no, I'm I don't know. Um, the thing I was the thing that I've been listening to uh, the last day or two is the new Bethany Curve record, which is awesome. It's called Murder, and I think it just came out, and uh, it's their reunion record. They hadn't put out a record since 2003, I think, something like that, but. It's hard to believe that was a long time but, ago. But Bethany Curve is, is yeah. awesome. They're like a super underappreciated shoegaze band from California. Yeah, they are they were around during the original era. One of the, uh, probably my favorite American shoegaze band from like that, from the 90s. But, what, what, uh, between them and Swirlies and Medicine, maybe, if you want to hmm. throw that in there. A lot of people, some people mentioned Drop 19s, but I could never get into that record. Yeah, um, I think It's got some tracks. That track, Angel, is sick. But yeah, the new Bethany Curve record is really good. They always good. play that when I listen to Lacing Radio. <laughs> yes, a, I listen to my own band's radio Dude, on yes, that's, that's <laughs> mostly what I listen to. I find so much good shit on there. Maybe we'll oh. make eight cents somehow. I don't know. Mm-hmm. The, the Lazy Legs happen to split. I was listening to that a lot. It's really good. Because, um, of course. And then um, I've been listening to this electronic record by Nkisi called Seven Directions. It's good. Which is really good. It's sort of like a mix between Burial and Aphex Twin and that kind of stuff. Nice, man. Yeah, I got to find some like, I've been, the only newer stuff I've been listening to recently has been post-rock bands. So I've got to, I got to start finding some new stuff. Hmm. There's rocking. only one post-rock band that matters. <laughs> which, which, which band? Fucking Mogwai. Yeah. Sorry, oh, dude. I, I've been making I this love... argument for like ten years. I'm sorry. It's like automatic. It's like if you hit my knee, my leg would flip. You know. I love I like Mogwai, what you like, I don't but dude, when it, so Godspeed. I love Godspeed, man. They're like they're up there. I got burnt uh, on Godspeed. I like Godspeed. I liked Godspeed, but I like listened to it so much that now I'm just like, eh, I've heard it. And the new albums, they don't do a whole lot for me. Hmm. I think I think so for for the longest time my favorite post rock band was This Will Destroy You. Mono is starting to like they're starting to get there. They just released an album last week and it is fucking incredible. It's I don't so think I've heard good. anything from Mono since like maybe the first or second record. It's been a long time since I've heard. Uh dude, so like the last two albums have been absolutely incredible. 
I would highly recommend them, especially if you're into like heavier, like post rock stuff. It's really cool. I will peep. Well, let's add it to our Spotify. So you guys have got the the record coming up at least sometime within the next year or so. Anything else that you guys got coming down the the pipeline? Well, you never know. Um, we like Jerry mentioned, we might have a split coming out with uh, with our friends in Prayer Circle. We don't know when that's going to happen, but we may be recording the songs for it at the same time as we do this this next album. It depends on how many songs end up making the album and then how many we have left over and then what ends up happening because there's some discussion of that Prayer Circle split being a 12-inch split instead of a 7-inch. That's awesome. And so for maybe someone that hasn't heard you guys before or wants to check you out, like where could they go to keep up with what you guys are doing and to listen to some of your music? Well, Surely our Instagram <laughs> is the best place, I right? Would, I would say Instagram for like keeping up with what us the fucks up and like yeah we're, we're pretty heavy on there we're kind of like uh we do it for the gram scene, yeah we we flex for the gram on the reg mm-hmm. dude <laughs> some of the memes you guys post always cra- cracks me up <laughs> hey, some of them are original content too so we feel pretty good about that but uh instagram to see what's happening with us uh to listen to us uh lacing.bandcamp.com's got everything uh pay what you want aka free downloads um Everything's on Spotify and all the streaming services. But, um, yeah, we don't really fuck with our face. We have a Facebook, but honestly, we don't use it that much because I'm always getting notifications to update it. And I'm like, <laughs> no, because I don't like yeah. it. Face- Facebook kind of sucks. Yeah, it yeah. really sucks. That's, yeah. a, that's a whole other hour of a podcast. Oh, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Hit us up on the on the gram and then uh, anywhere you. I mean, shit. We're on iTunes. We had a Tumblr. Are we on Title? <laughs> I think we're we. No, we are on Title. Yeah, we actually we are. Yeah. Nice. I got stoked title. about that for a second. <laughs> Pandora, all that. If you've got rich people money and you want to just look, stream us on Title, <laughs> and if you want to just keep up with me personally, follow Rights the number four gamers on Twitter. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna give out your Twitch? Yeah, why not? <laughs> I read somewhere that you only need 1,000 fans of your yourself to like have a career that you can live off of. And uh, I'm not I think I have man. like 600 or so followers. So if you guys could <laughs> get me over that hump, I could quit my day job, focus exclusively on uh, gamer rights advocacy and shoegaze. <laughs> 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 Well, shit, guys, thank you so much for agreeing to speak with me. This was a ton of fun. Thank you. You guys don't get anything more than two inches of snow and everything shuts down. I ain't trying to die. Band motto, don't die. (laughs) Don't die. Never die. Well, have a good night, guys. You You too, too, man. Thanks so much. Thank you. And there you have it, folks. That's my conversation with Lacing. If you haven't checked out their music before, you need to get on top of that. Their recent release with with Lazy Legs is awesome. The song Crush is such a goddamn good song. As I mentioned in the start of this episode, I really enjoyed my conversation with those dudes. I also really appreciate them giving me some suggestions on gear. I'm trying to build up my, my pedal collection, and pedals are fucking expensive as shit. But being able to get some tips on some pedals to check out, especially cheap ones, is definitely appreciated. I'll make sure to add links in the show notes to how you can stay up to date with lacing, what they've got going on, how you could listen to their music, potentially buy some of their shit. I hope sometime in the near future, the dudes from lacing will make it up to the Northeast so I can catch a show of theirs because I feel like their set would be freaking loud as hell. Follow the show if you can as well. Subscribe, rate us if possible. And as always, get them buns out there, create something cool. I will see you next time.